Welcome to Kansas Ag Report. I'm Ken Rogers. On this week's program, it has become a tradition. We talk with the president of the Kansas Farm Bureau, Joe Newland, has just completed his first year as leader of the state's largest general farm organization. We'll discuss what happened at their convention, also look to the new year. We'll also have features from the Kansas Soybean Commission, Kansas Department of Agriculture, and Kansas Grain Sorghum, along with a weekly update from the Kansas Livestock Association and market information from Pena. Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers, Kansas Farm Bureau, a grassroots ag organization representing the state's farm and ranch families since 1919, kfb.org. And the Kansas Wheat Commission, lending in the adoption of profitable innovations from wheat, online at kswheat.com. In agricultural news, four new board directors recently appointed by Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack were sworn in at the Sorghum Checkoff's annual December meeting. Also, a couple of producers began their second term after being reappointed by the secretary. The board elected Kendall Hodgson of Little River to be the chairman for 2024. He said he's honored to lead the organization into a new era of growth and innovation. He said sorghum is a crop with incredible potential. He's excited to work alongside the leaders and producers to elevate its impact. Together, he said, we will cultivate opportunities, foster sustainable growth, and strengthen the sorghum industry. U.S. Uh, checkoff program, Sorghum Checkoff Program Executive Director Norma Ritz Johnson said amidst the challenges of persisting drought, innovation thrives in the heart of the challenges. She said we're ecstatic that the group of producers and board members embody that resilience that will steer the sorghum industry towards a horizon of groundbreaking possibilities. USDA says ag producers can now enroll in the Farm Service Agency's agriculture risk coverage and price loss coverage programs for the 2024 crop year. Producers can enroll now and make election changes through the deadline, which is March 15th of next year. Now, this current farm bill was extended through September 30th of 2024, and that allows authorized programs like ARC and PLC to continue operating. Zach Nushino, administrator for the Farm Service Agency, says it's business as usual for ARC and PLC implementation for that 24 crop year. He said the programs provide critical financial protection against commodity market volatilities for many American farmers. So he says don't delay that enrollment. He also advises producers to avoid the rush and contact the local FSA office for an appointment because even he says with no changes in the program, elections for next year, of farmers still need to sign a contract to enroll. Kansas State University took another step towards its $220 million in improvements to its agriculture infrastructure when it broke ground earlier this month on the new Animal Science Event Center. KSU Foundation President and CEO Greg Willems announced the new facility named the Bilbury Family Event Center. It's an indoor arena, will become the TJ Quarter Horse Walker Family Arena. The facility will be located adjacent to the Stanley Stout Center north of the Manhattan campus. That's a known area as the Edge District. Willems said the Bilberry Family Event Center will showcase livestock performance competitions, judging shows, and large events to connect youth organizations, prospective students, companies, and the public in positive and meaningful ways. The project planned for completion by August of 2025. Now, earlier this year, K-State began construction at the Agronomy Research and Innovation Center. That's also north of campus. It's across Kimball from the uh, Snyder Family Football uh, Complex. Now, next spring, K-State anticipates breaking ground the Global Center for Grain and Food Innovation. That will connect Weber Hall and Call Hall. That's the northern edge of Manhattan's uh, uh, main campus there. Uh, they currently house much of K-State's animal science program. Now, there will also go some major renovations beginning early in 2025. In total, the improvements represent an investment of $220 million in K-State's ag infrastructure, including new and renovated facilities. As of late this year, the KSU Foundation reports that $143 million has been raised towards that goal. K-State President Richard Lenton told a gathering back December 15th 
that the Agriculture Innovation Initiative is one that is important and is the largest fundraiser so far in K-State history. When we come back, we'll talk with Joe Newland, the president of the Kansas Farm Bureau, when we return on the Kansas Ag Report. The Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by Kansas Grain Sorghum, growers working together. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Grass and grain, online or in the mail, keeping Kansas farmers informed for over 60 years. Grassandgrain.com. And our guest is the president of the Kansas Farm Bureau, kind of our yearly uh, catch-up after their annual meeting, Joe Newland. Uh, Joe, good to yeah. see you. Well, thank you, Ken. What a great opportunity it is to visit with you about an opportunity I had the last few days. All right, so we, as we're talking, we're taping this just really moments after the election, back in the home office now, getting ready to go on. So let's, let's review. This was your first year as being president of Kansas Farm Bureau. What were some of those highlights and some of the things you shared with the, those at the convention? I think the best thing that I could say is the people that I get to work with. Getting to know the other state Farm Bureau presidents is just so unique uh, of an opportunity. These individuals are some of the best in the country. That to get to visit with them and discuss issues that affect us on the national level, uh, that's pretty special. Because whatever we do in the state, it's, it's big. But when we work on the federal issues, that's, that's really huge. In your comments at the annual uh, banquet, uh, you talked about, you know, the partnerships that you've seen formed and some of the partnerships this team has now brought together with some traditional ones and maybe not so traditional when you look at trying to find solutions. Correct. And the U.S. Agricultural Partnership Plan that we can partner with other uh, partners, other states, other entities of all kinds to discuss and come up with solutions to, you know, issues that really affect us here in Kansas. Uh, take, for instance, the Prop 12 uh, issue that we had in California that truly does affect us in Kansas. And so you have that, of course, our Engage Kansas, where we can help train leaders for the future across the state, uh, especially in our rural communities. We need to make sure we are training the leaders for tomorrow there. There are several different groups that Kansas Farm Bureau sponsors and, and does leadership training and those go back and now we're seeing some of those that have they've gone through there to really step up and take leadership roles and so we're seeing those uh, finally pay dividends in, in growing those local communities where those farmers and ranchers serve. Exactly. You know our leader circle where we have past and present leaders come together to actually help fund our KFB leadership program. It's extremely important that we keep that going and make sure that we're training those future leaders. But then also our two-year program with the Caston Fellows, which is very intense uh, leadership training for international and uh, abroad trips as well. But that type of study really does uh, prepare those people for the world. and. Uh, we can't just just depend on leaders for today in this state, but it, it is on the international level as well. We're talking with Joe Newland, who is the president of the Kansas Farm Bureau, just wrapping up their annual meeting as we're recording this. We're going to take a break and then talk about some of those policy and other things that came out of the meeting. We'll do that in just a moment. Kansas Ag Report brought to you in part by the Kansas Livestock Association supporting members' business interests and meeting consumer demands, KLA.org. Oldie Seed Farms, carrying soil-specific seed. Find them on the web at oldieseed.com. That's O-H-L-D-E seed.com. And Kansas Corn, building the future at kansascorn.com.
Kansas Farm Bureau President Joe Newland is our guest as we caught up with him right after their annual meeting. And uh, Joe, um, you know, not only is it time to celebrate, but it's also time to get business done. And Farm Bureau did some business, and one of those is looking at leadership. And you did have some new members come on the the women's uh, uh, conference committee type thing, and and to do a lot of those. And that's changed over the years. It's they're they're very active uh, farm women oh, on that, that committee. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the women's committee is totally different, I would say, because these are women that are absolutely involved in their local farming operations. Uh, getting into these leadership positions that they can be very influential on what we do as an organization. So it's very important. Uh, we had new members get onto that state committee now, and so you'll see a whole different format. Uh, Laura Hafner is, of course, the chair, and she is just doing an mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal job getting and uh, focused on what is important not only to the women, but agriculture mm -hmm. in general. Also, the voting delegates chose the new vice president. Now, somebody that's familiar to a lot of folks and currently serving on the KFB board, but uh, a, new, uh, a new number two, in a sense. That is correct. Uh, every other year, we select a new vice president, as we do every other year on the presidency. And this year, we elected uh, Glenn Bronkow from the 1st District, and he will uh, start serving immediately. Right. Uh, Glenn is well-known across the state. You know, he worked in extension. And so people from the west to the east know Glenn, and I think it's a great opportunity for a young man to, to really step up and step into another leadership role. And I think he's a good fit. Jeff Grossenbacher has been an outstanding vice president. Uh, we'll miss him greatly because he brought a lot of knowledge, uh, years of experience uh, to the organization, and we wish him a, all the best in his endeavors going forward. All right, let's talk policy now and the resolutions process. It starts at the grassroots earlier on in the year, gets to this point. Uh, I would guess uh, uh, there was probably, even though there's not much we can do about it, a lot of angst about why a farm bill isn't done. Absolutely. But, you know, we take it in stride. We know they've extended the farm bill for another full year. Uh, we are in hopes that by March, we're going to have some uh, farm bill language in place so that for sure by July we can have it passed and have those uh, policies and programs rolled out way before the end of September next year. Other things that came out from a, either from a federal or state standpoint that, uh, that the members uh, voted to, for Farm Bureau to really advocate for? Uh, policy on energy was huge this year. A uh, lot of new policy, especially on uh, transmission line sightings, in the use of eminent domain. So uh, we'll see and we'll be visiting, of course, with you and others uh, in the legislature coming this new session on a lot of new energy programs. Uh, water will continue to be a, a big issue across the state. Uh, we can see now how important our reservoir systems are to us and uh, of course the aquifer, mm -hmm. those problems aren't going away. You know, we continue to see these reports to come out and see what farm income is in 2023. Um, you know, we kind of got used to that where we were maybe the year before. It's been a bit of a change. Uh, what kind of message do you have to your members uh, that Farm Bureau can do to try to help that bottom line? I mean, there are, uh, there's, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of folks that are uh, concerned as they go to their banker to renew that uh, operating loan for another year. Well, it, it reverts right back to the farm bill again, uh, making sure we have that safety net in crop insurance, but that we also address the PLC and ARC programs within that farm bill also. Uh, changes need to be made because f farmers, because of droughts uh, or whatever the instance, they're suffering. And we need to protect the, the food system that we have because it is a uh, federal issue but it is a national security issue, All right. and so we need to make sure it stays safe. 
Well, Joe, as always, we appreciate, uh, this has kind of been a, uh, something we've done for the last several years right around Christmas uh, uh, to kind of uh, put a good capstone on the year. So as always, great to catch up with you and uh, best of luck as we all venture forward in this thing called production agriculture. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Ken. I sure appreciate the opportunity to visit with you anytime. All right. Joe Newland, who is the president of the Kansas Farm Bureau, has joined us. We'll have more coming up in just a moment. Stay with us. Grain sorghum is one of the most important cereal crops worldwide, and Kansas leads the nation in its production. Over the years, sorghum has been either exported, used in animal feed domestically, or for other industrial uses. Recently, its use in the ethanol market has seen tremendous growth, with 30% of domestic sorghum typically going to ethanol production. Kansas Grain Sorghum is committed to sorghum research, market development, and education. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Hi everyone, Maddie Meyer, Kansas Grain Sorghum's program director here to bring you the latest Kansas Grain Sorghum updates. As many of you know, we work very closely with the United Sorghum Checkoff Program, and the USDA has recently announced the individuals who will be serving on the United Sorghum Checkoff Board of Directors. And I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate the following individuals. James Haas of Colorado, Ethan J. Miller of Missouri, Tracy Zink of Nebraska, David Shem of Kansas, Brian Adamek of Texas, and Scott Earlbeck of Texas. Five of these members will serve a three-year term from December 2023 to December 2026, with the exception of Earl Beck, who will serve a two-year term, and his role begins immediately. We look forward to connecting with these new and current individuals at the national board meetings down in Lubbock, Texas, from December 11th through 14. It's already hard to believe that we're at the end of 2023. It isn't too early to begin thinking about upcoming meetings and events that will take place in early 2024. Along with the Kansas Soybean, Wheat, and Corn Associations, we look forward to hosting the annual Kansas Commodity Classic, held January 26th at the Salina Hilton Garden Inn. We've got a great lineup of speakers and topics prepared to provide a one-stop shop for Kansas farmer leaders. I'd also like to mention... Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas corn farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. Affiliates of the soybean industry in Kansas should be gearing up to attend the 2024 Kansas Soybean Expo. The annual event set in Topeka returns January 10th to the Maynard Conference Center in conjunction with the Topeka Farm Show. The scheduled agenda for Expo includes valuable information on research, managing risk, and weather forecasting. Participants can hear from Kansas State University agronomic specialists on the changing research landscape, learn top marketing tactics from Kansas State University agricultural economists, and understand upcoming weather patterns from Joe Loria, Fox 4 Kansas City meteorologist. To close out a day of learning, Dave Lewis Entertainment plans to amp up the fun with the Game Show Roadshow. While Expo provides growers with a preview of the upcoming crop year, it also celebrates the preceding season with the announcement of the 2023 Yield and Value Contest winners. Additional awards for Friend of Soy and Meritorious Service are presented at the luncheon. Notably, former Senator Pat Roberts, an icon in agriculture, is the invited luncheon speaker. Roberts began representing Kansas in the U.S. Senate in 1997 following a long tenure in the U.S. House of Representatives. He is the first person to chair both the House and Senate Agriculture Committees. Kansas Soybean Expo brings together soybean producers in Kansas for a day of learning, industry updates, and networking. The Kansas Soybean Association organizes the event with checkoff funding from the Commission. Expo is a free event. Registration and exhibits open at 8.30 a.m. with the program scheduled to begin at 9 a.m. 
visit www.kansassoybeans.org slash expo to view the agenda and register for expo to reserve your seat. Online pre-registration is not required but is recommended to expedite the registration process on the day of expo. agriculture is a significant part of the Kansas economy, so animal health is of critical importance not only to the agriculture industry, but to the whole state. That's why protecting animal health is part of the mission of the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and we make it a priority with our focus on foreign animal disease planning, training, and exercising. In December, KDA will lead a three-day functional exercise named Pathways to practice the state's agriculture emergency response plan by playing out an animal disease scenario. In the event of an agriculture incident, the emergency response is led by the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and our incident management team develops policies and operational plans to manage the disease response and to provide factual, transparent public information and education to the industry and the public, including a phone bank to receive calls from citizens who would be affected by an incident. More than 150 players and observers helped with last year's exercise, and we expect similar involvement this year with participants representing agriculture organizations, private industry, federal, state, and local public agencies, and even animal health agencies from other states. Responding to a foreign animal disease will require cooperation among all of these entities in order to stop the spread of the disease and enable the industry to get back to business as quickly as possible. This year's exercise looks at disease traceability in the early stages of a multi-species disease outbreak. These annual exercises have been instrumental in expanding the state's response plan and honing details based on new challenges and experiences each year. This continual improvement of the Animal Disease Response Plan supports the investment Kansas has made in sustaining the rigorous practice via the full-scale exercise, and we will continue those efforts to protect animal agriculture in Kansas. More farmers and ranchers than ever have chosen to be BQA certified. The Farm Service Agency is waiving the 30-day requirement for producers to submit notices of loss for the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program and the Livestock Indemnity Programs. With the waiver, producers now will be able to submit 2023 notices of loss as soon as possible once losses are realized or no later than the established annual program application for payment deadlines for each program. Therefore, those who incurred ELAP eligible losses in 2023 will need to submit a notice of loss by January 30th of 2024. Producers applying for LIP payments will have until February 29th of 2024 to submit their notice of loss for 2023. ELAP provides assistance to producers who have experienced eligible losses due to adverse weather, including blizzards, drought, and wildfires. It covers grazing and feed losses, transportation of water and feed to livestock, and hauling livestock to grazing. ELAP is designed to address losses not covered by other FSA disaster assistance programs. LIP provides disaster assistance to producers and contract growers who experience livestock deaths above normal mortality caused by eligible loss conditions, including adverse weather. LIP also helps producers who must sell livestock at a reduced price because of an injury from certain loss conditions. FSA County Committees will review all notices of loss for both ELAP and LIP that previously were disapproved for the 2023 program year due to late filing and reevaluate them to determine if the waiver applies. Producers who are unsure about the status of their notice of loss or application for payment should contact their local FSA office as soon as possible. Jake McCall with Pinion Ag. As we move into December and the year end, there is plenty to watch across the board trade. Starting with the grains, each market is taken on its own concerns as corn settles into a trading range with no real story to back it up. Exports have been consistently within estimates with 1,289,000 tons being sold in the week ending November 30th, which is down from last week, but double the same week from last year. Ethanol reports showed a big week for production with 7.532 million barrels. This is the biggest production week we've seen since before August, 
but that pace will need to continue in order to meet the USDA's targets as we handle a fairly large carryout going forward. Meanwhile, the soybean market seems intent on watching the South American crop, which it is expected to once again set records. Beneficial rains have been coming to our peers in Brazil and Argentina as we come to the critical growth period in the Southern Hemisphere over the next two months, and that will weigh heavily on the minds of those contemplating our own export capacity and to what extent Brazil can capture the world market once that crop is harvested. Until then, our exporters have been hard at work selling another 1,517,000 tons last week, which is down from last week, but well over 693,000 tons last year. This week on the front month January contract, we have been doing battle around the psychological $13 mark, which could prove to be an important pivot point for the weeks to come. We do continue to see flash sales to China and unknown destinations, but it is important to note that issues along the Mississippi River and the Panama Canal will provide uh, complications to those wishing to ship cargoes to the Far East. At the Panama Canal, reduced water levels have severely hampered the traffic of Panamax shippers that can make it through the locks in a day, and grain shippers generally losing out in bidding wars to higher value shippers for the valuable spots in line. The wheat market has seen some sparks fly this week, with over a million metric tons of soft red wheat being sold to China in just three sales. This came along with some fun short covering that gave a solid rally off the lows in Chicago, Kansas City, and Minneapolis wheat markets. Whether that will continue is anyone's guess, but it was a breath of fresh air to a demoralized wheat market that has seemed to have a one-sided conversation between bulls and bears ever since wheat harvest concluded last summer. Cattle markets continue to be locked in a downward trend, with a pattern of steep moves down followed by a small recovery time and time again. In some months, we are now approaching contract lows, as this fall's move has erased many long-time gains. As many state, the old stair-step-up uh, stair and elevator-down tendency of the market, producers are eager to see when we can carve out some sort of support for a low, but just like the high, it will be difficult to tell until after that happens. The crude market has seen a rapid fall off since the end of November as the world debates economic strength, current stocks, and the ability of OPEC to control the price. The dollar, on the other hand, has seen some recent strength, though still holding well below October highs. If you have any questions on the markets or would like help with your own marketing program, feel free to give us a call at 888-452-8751, and we'll look forward to talking with you. My name is Jake McCall with Pinion Ag. And I hope you have a Merry Christmas season. That's our show this week. Be social with us online, kansasagreport.net, or our social media pages. From all of us at the Kansas Ag Report, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll be back with you next week as we wrap up the Kansas Ag Report for 2023. Merry Christmas. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com.